Um, I'm so glad uh, to be here, to be invited. Um, yeah, I um, traveled from Amsterdam by train, which was a very pleasant experience and a little bit drony. Um, so yeah, today I would like to share with you, uh, let's say, what I experimented with uh, over the past three, four years of my artistic practice. As Ralph mentioned, initially I studied to be a scientist uh, in uh, the field of biomedicine, so biochemistry and molecular biology more specifically. And uh, it's actually with that experience that I found it um, really uh, provoking and interesting to reflect on uh, biotechnology through bioart. And bioart, I think, is um, a rather narrow and defined field um, that um, I don't think really holds all of my practice as well as um, many of, our co of my colleagues uh, that started with this bio art I think are, are now pushing the, the boundaries of it. Um, but what I think I still hold on to is a, a sort of a, a criticality about this relationship to living beings um, that is mediated through various technologies. And as you will see, I, I find that um, different technologies, like the, one that were, the ones that work with wet media as well as uh, the digital media ones, come from sort of a similar set of assumptions. And uh, they uh, sort of cross-pollinate um, and create this particular type of worldview uh, which we internalize and it becomes sort of a common sense. And I think with all these uh, works, I've come to s sort of slowly, you know, unpack that with examples. Uh, and I hope uh, to take you on the journey uh, with me right now. So, uh, yeah, I'm finishing up this postdoc. Um, where we set out to do to make a machine that thinks it is itself a plant. Of course, this wasn't something uh, to to be done literally, but rather to to start thinking about how this digital technology and robotics and uh, areas of high like high tech uh, sensors. Uh, um, automated or pixel farming, uh, these advancements in agriculture actually mirror uh, advancements of digi digital surveillance technologies uh, in humans. Um, okay, For, I guess um, I would like to ask maybe who here comes from, from the digital arts? or design and fine art. Anyone else from another field? No, okay. But I, I, I suppose no one um, that has a natural sciences background. No, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just start uh, by asking you, what is on this picture? Hair. A hair, yeah. Or is it a rabbit? No, it's a hair. Okay. Uh, um, actually, th that's not the point. The point is that we all, of course, go for the fuzzy animal, the uh, fairy, <laughs> hairy animal, <laughs> furry animal that is uh, pictured, uh, of course, centrally here. But we are blind to the plants that are in this picture, right? So we see here uh, blades of grass, uh, then we have the clover, the, the flowers of the cr clover, maybe some leaves of dandelion there. But the fact uh, that we would almost always perceive plants as the backdrop to some sort of animal is called plant blindness. 
And there have been many explanations for this, um, both on one hand, this uh, furry boundary that we seem to relate to animals that are actually mammals, like ourselves, right? And the further apart, uh, away you go from the being mammal, the less um, empathic you are, as well as uh, the less interested. Um, it, on the other hand, I think it's also kind of interesting to think about the long tradition of Western cosmology that has always placed plants at, as sort of at the bottom of our hierarchy of life, right? First there's death, well, uh, death, dead material, minerals, right? And then we have plants, animals, uh, humans, and then gods, uh, or gods. Um, and I was really curious as to why uh, this happens and if and how it would be possible to sort of change this perspective. And I'm not talking uh, as a person who has always been uh, infatuated with plants, actually quite the opposite. I, I was absolutely plant blind, absolutely disinterested. And I thought that it was kind of unacceptable for me as a person rationally knowing how important they are to the ecosystem, how they are basically are linked to the sun, right? Because it's through the plants uh, and their photosynthesis, uh, they're fixing all this energy, they're the primary producers, and so basically all of life on Earth is a result of their excess. And still, always in the background. Um, so in 2015, I designed uh, this well, it's sort of like a, a chart that would map my gradual journey towards uh, discovering why we are plant, why we are uh, blind to plants. <laughs> because obviously, if you start to tackle this question, you come to see uh, that as soon as you look at plants in, on different scales and you c compare, okay, on one hand, the human individual and a field of grass. Uh, yeah, those aren't really comparable. But then plant cells in tissue culture and human cells in tissue culture. So what's the difference there? Or on the other hand, on the other side where you see this network or this hierarchy, when we have complex systems and uh, a deeper time, we start thinking about the relationship uh, between plants and people. All of a sudden, it's also not so oppositional anymore, right? Uh, did the humans domesticate wheat or did wheat domesticate humans, right? So as soon as agriculture started, the whole lifestyle, the whole culture went from, from this hunter-gatherer to an agricultural uh, type of, of being. So in fact, uh, it's only in certain scales and in certain situations that uh, this difference between humans and plants seems really irreconcilable. And so uh, I'm, I'm not going to go too much into this, um, but it was a set of works that were experiential but also experimental uh, to see how these, to enact these relationships uh, anew and see what kind of qualities emerge. So in Scotopoiesis, I said, okay, can I become uh, the object of plants' uh, cognition? And uh, this process would be called intercognition. And via the sign of the shadow, I would stand in front of the cress for 20 hours. This is what it looked like. And as a result of this uh, commitment to stillness for 20 hours, we would see this this result, right? Like the, there is sort of this proof that while I was trying to let go of my animal movement and stand as still as possible, the plants were also kind of not so satisfied, at least that's how I interpret it. Uh, they were trying to uh, grow into, uh, out of the shadow and into the light. And this resulted in this sort of proof of, of uh, cognition. So the, the perception was actually two-sided, right? But in fact, I think with this performance, 
I absolutely also took on the role of this human, which uh, somehow needs confirmation of and through the human senses and the human scale. So choosing the 20 hours here wasn't because the plant wouldn't be able to perceive uh, a brief shadow over it, uh, going over it, but it's actually only through the, with this time that you could also, as a human, see that there has been change occurring. But, I mean, there were other things that were happening besides this physical plane of transformation. I think, um, something shifted in me as well. It was the first time that I had actually spent so long and so, uh, so much time with the plants and being very attentive to them and seeing them change in real time, which is really, really uncanny. Um, but from this project onwards, I wasn't, I've, I, something changed. So I felt like I wasn't creating the works on my own in terms of the human manipulating the plants. So, in a way, this kind of deconstruction had already started to happen in me, even though I don't think I realized it then. Uh, in this project, I wanted to basically become the mother to a baby plant, not a genetic mother, so it's not about putting human genes in plant cells, but an epigenetic mother. So, to create an artificial womb, and have these little seedlings be created in this, from, from a single cell to basically a plant, have them grow in an incubator, like, you know, test tube babies. Only this incubator would be filled uh, or overflowing with hormones of my body. Uh, and this is not n nonsensical because hormones, uh, as, as estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, predate the separation between plants, animals, and even, you know, we have some similar hormones with, we share them with bacteria. So it's kind of like a communication channel that is open still, right? So when you, que when you question uh, whether it is possible to talk to plants, well, yes, probably on the level of the sound, but you are also talking to them with your body with these volatile secretions, right? Um, so I was using this and a scientific protocol to make these plant-human monsters, which weren't genetically changed, only through, uh, for this one generation, they had the imprint of my body as well. And in this performance, it was a micro-performance, um, uh, I instigated a meeting between human cancer cells and a nanochloropsis, a single-celled algae, uh, in the medium that is uh, great for cancer cells. But it was sort of important for me to enact this uh, kind of, the meeting of these workhorses from the field of biomedicine, right? So, so even though we could hardly identify with carcinoma with cancer cells as people, they're considered something pathological. It is actually based on tissue cultures that a lot of medicine is developed. The vaccines are developed, right? And so kind of if you want to think about a meeting between a human and a plant, well, this is also a way of that happening. And of course it hints or it, it actually um, evokes I think for the first time in this series that uh, the, the human has also its very uh, much commodified counterpart. And I think that comes back over and over again um, in the work. So here in this last still, what happened in this uh, meeting was that actually quite quickly, within uh, the next two days, there was an appearance of these kind of um, larger cells with an algae inside. So they weren't like cancer cells, which would normally be stuck to the bottom. You see the, the cancer, oops, the cancer cells are that. Um, those, um, they, they actually attach to the surface and spread out. Uh, but those that seem to have ingested the algae change shape, change shape and 
somehow perhaps this was the first step towards another endosymbiosis. Maybe this was the creation of a new hybrid uh, that um, wasn't allowed or, yeah, that was killed before it became its own organism. Okay. So in this uh, sort of uh, triptych uh, of four works, I really explored the different levels of relating between humans and plants. And of course, this also bumped up against the question of what it means to be human and what it means to be plants. Um, but all throughout these experiments, I was kind of relying on technoscience as the methodology with which to approach plants. And technoscience is strongly facilitated by computation. Uh, and Eugene Thacker calls this biomedia. So in terms of un understanding the living, uh, in terms of informatics and having that which is informatic be able to inform the living. Um, it is through computation that we are able to sequence DNA, create databases, uh, copy-paste the genes together. The whole synthetic biology is possible at this level because of computers, right? And it's this logic of uh, informatics that is carried then through to an understanding of what a living organism is. Um, and if there's some sort of tension between the way that under in the so-called surveillance society our behavior is monitored, uh, deposited, uh, sort of shaped, uh, I mean, the, 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 our behavior is datafied, um, then used to become basically a product uh, with which we actually, usually through the screen, but also in the city, um, we are uh, regulated by the product of uh, these, al these algorithms. Yeah. Sorry, I got lost a little bit there. Um, that is to say, in today's society, one of the questions of privacy of the data uh, that we leave everywhere isn't only about whether we deserve to have an intimate uh, uh, selfhood. It is also about whether we allow this data to trickle outside of us because from this data, measures could be put in place, apps created, technologies developed that would manipulate our behavior in ways that we would not be aware of. And I think this is something that uh, is now uh, through all this theory, like uh, Kate Crawford and Shoshana Zuboff and others, they have made this very apparent. And I'm sure that most of you have heard about this topic, right? Surveillance society or uh, uh, data capitalism. Anything like this. Okay. So imagine what it's like to be a plant, right? Where these processes have been super intense for a really, really long time now in agriculture, right? As a plant uh, that is headed to our supermarket, you have no opportunity to be different. Well, if you're this, uh, the slightest bit different, you don't even make it to the supermarket. And I think that's a really interesting um, way of investigating these technologies by look, taking a look at them through the perspective of the plant or maybe uh, sort of swapping the human and the plant continuously. Uh, to see actually, um, to alienate ourselves, to not immediately jump to conclusions as we are all, I think, quite triggered by this, uh, these impositions, 
but uh, yeah, to, to take plants as allies, take them on board, and then see how these technologies actually seem from the perspective of the plant. So this, uh, before you saw some robots, agricultural robots that are being developed to actually perform quite um, sensitive and yeah, uh, tasks like, you know, picking raspberries or something like that and measuring all sorts of things or um, spot treating for fungal diseases. So the machine, machine vision detects only those leaves that actually have the, the fungus and treats uh, the fungus there. Um, this is an image uh, from the satellite um, and it's an index uh, showing where photosynthesis is uh, taking, taking place and it's based on um, color, I mean this um, differential vegeta vegetation, normalized differential vegetation index. So all these technologies are actually used uh, together with, with centralized databases, databases to help farmers riding these huge machines better treat the land that they're working on uh, very, very specifically. So let's say here, this is the field of oh, in a way, when, when you have um, some farm equipment, right, and it does, I, I don't know, let's say it's using um, herbicides, right, it will know that this is an area that is different from the others, and it will treat it differently in order to normalize the, the crop, let's say, if this was corn or whatever. So it's this degree of precision and this degree of a sophisticated integration of sensors and databases, past experiences, that allows for this automation and absolute manipulation of plants that are already genetically super modified, right? In order to be as monocultural as possible. And that because it's driven by profit. I mean, the ultimate uh, uh, imperative. Uh, yeah, this is. Um, and a, a shot from the tulip, um, the, uh, the tulip auction house, which nowadays uh, isn't really done live anymore. The, the, the auction is no longer performed by people looking at the plants. They're actually just sitting behind the computers um, watching the stocks fluctuate. Um, yeah, let's skip this. So actually, this is sort of tied to the research that I'm doing now. I, as a person who has lived in the city all my life so far, and most likely it'll stay this way, it's really hard for me to know what it's like to actually cultivate plants on land because the conditions and the relations change. And as far as, uh, most of the farmers that I've spoken to, all the accounts I've read, uh, this is a really tough life because you're super dependent on um, yeah, conditions like the weather conditions, the, the markets, um, droughts, I mean, climate change, right? Um, uh, it's a very precarious job, um, but it's actually, not unlike some experiences that you might have. Um, no, I'll, I won't go into that, drop that. We'll come back to that later. What I would like to uh, contrast with this type of uh, living with plants when plants are there for sustenance is uh, this example. Hello, nice to meet you. The Netherlands produce about 50% of all flowers in the world. The most famous one of all, the tulip of course. Flowers are really remarkable organisms. We've known for decades that they can actually communicate to each other through their root system. For the past uh, two years, Wageningen University has been working uh, very closely with Google to use cutting-edge technology uh, to look deeper into communication with plants. Hello. 
we collected an incredible amount of information. Using automated machine learning, we turned this information into a new rudimentary language, which is becoming more and more sophisticated over time. And the more we listen to nature, the more we discover the amazing things it has to say. Okay, Google, talk to my tulip. What do you want? Water, please. We've applied all this research into our latest product, Google Tulip. Two granddaughters, Francis, we just had a second baby. That is so interesting. And <laughs> finished. <laughs> Nothing left. More. You're... You promised more water. At Keukenhof, we are very excited about Tulip technology. We like to know what Tulips need. And what better way than to ask them? I need water. water. More light. Please improve humidity. What is a Please come here. More space. No, no more compost. No water. Thank you. Who are you? Why are there so many, many like me? This way. More light. Of course, this is only the beginning. We're rolling out the tulip language in the beginning of April, but we're already well underway with several updates. Hello? No. Cactus. Leave me alone. It's so great not to have a one-way relationship with the tubes anymore. What is the meaning of my existence? Tulip is a breakthrough in human-plant communication, letting users around the world communicate with any tulip. OK, Google. Play my favorite music. Uh, yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, April Fool's joke, right? Uh, for, from the Netherlands, obviously. Um, it's funny, but it's also, I don't know, very indicative of the way that merging tech with plants uh, is sort of seen or desired from the city dwellers. I think um, in arts we have also been developing a lot of this, right? Let's equip plants with sensors and then all of a sudden their uh, vitality uh, is represented through this augmentation uh, with which we relate uh, more easily. And at the same time, what scares me is that this uh, commercial joke was actually sourced by Google. It's so easy to just replace the tulips with people in this case, right? What do you need? You know, let's have, we're, we're gonna collect, we're gonna install all these sensors and collect all the data from you and then we'll be able to communicate with you and your needs in, in a way. So, um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's sort of like a, a telling snippet of, uh, yeah, popular commercials. Um, the same type of communication strategy is also utilized by scientists. So they're actually uh, in Wageningen, also in, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, they're using the, the twittering tree as a way to, uh, yeah, give a tree access to Twitter by it uh, continuously reporting on its conditions, on sap flow, on the, the amount of sun it receives, the drought, etc. And on the other hand, you see this spinach uh, who has been engineered in, in a way to produce, I think, nano, uh, uh, nano sensors. And uh, it could detect um, uh, some, some sort of uh, chemicals in the soil. And uh, with this, of course, it would be, there would be sensors extra in the spinach, but the tagline was, uh, a, a spinach will email you if it finds explosives, right? So it's actually tapping into this desire we have to be able to communicate with plants very much on human terms in, this, in using a similar platforms and similar technologies that we've grown accustomed to and that mediates much of our uh, engagement to other life, human and non-human these days. So if we unpack this, um, 
one of and also start to to start to use uh, the existing artificial intelligence programs uh, in conjunction with plants. So trying to better understand plants, um, I came up with this project and of course developed it in collaboration with programmers. Uh, as an introduction, I know, I won't introduce it, I'll just show it to you. He's still ma, 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 ma. Ma, 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 ga, 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 ga. Spot is a video, ga, ga, ma, ma, ga, ga. Does anybody recognize these structures? Huh? No, but these structures. This is a, the view from through a microscope. Sorry? Stoma. Yeah. Sorry? Exactly, yeah, exactly. So these are these microscopic leaf pores uh, or mouths. Stoma is basically an opening. Stomata is the, mo uh, the plural of this. And you see, so uh, the project was basically about uh, making time-lapse movies of, these, uh, of the stoma opening and closing and uh, then asking uh, a computer program that was developed for reading human lips to interpret what the plants are saying. And the same thing was also, uh, th the same challenge was posed to a Slovene interpreter for the deaf, uh, who, who yeah, uh, does a lot of this translation. And so what came out was, uh, as you saw, something <laughs> that resembled uh, basically nonsense, perhaps some coincidental words came out like mama, but actually uh, lip reading, um, as, as a practice is extremely difficult and super uh, context dependent. Uh, so even the best human lip readers get it right less than half, half of the time. And sort of that is also the rate at which the computer uh, program that has been trained on, on human um, language uh, would, would succeed. Um, and of course, right, this, uh, this, so this is a little view from, from this setup, uh, the plant we were lip reading uh, off of uh, is called Tradescantia zebrina, or the inch plant. It's actually an invasive plant in the Americas uh, where they don't have this really strong winter. Um, and yeah, we, I chose it because uh, it has nice, um, uh, stomata that are like the stomata are green and the rest of it is pink so it's easy <laughs> to detect because I thought that the computer would actually um, um, you know sort of for it that it would be easier for it to to see where the stomata are it turns out that uh, for the computer to read it uh, the colors had to be changed into skin color uh, of uh, Caucasian of course uh, so, uh, yeah, this is a project which is humorous, funny. It invites uh, with this silliness, uh, but also, again, points to the fact that we are also focused on language, on this particular capacity, which we are also, also proud of, right? Uh, and that's also how we want to frame communication with plants and not, let's say, through the bodies, the, uh, through the sen scents and the sweat and the vibrations that we produce. Um, in line with these uh, types of explorations, I also continued um, with a bit of the opposite. I, I started asking myself 
if we're being surveilled by these devices um, that we have grown to love, actually, uh, cannot do without, um, and that's one, one um, field of uh, inspiration. And the other field of inspiration had been that actually these devices um, don't necessarily distinguish uh, between us as users. Um, if they, it's called that they're, they're sort of, uh, that algorithms are indifferent to the user. So in theory, they should not uh, mind if the user is a plant and not a human. And this is sort of what I wanted to bring together. Americans have Fitbits and pedometers in order to track their physical activity. But as CBS 4's Gilma Avalos reports, some people have figured out how to earn steps without ever taking one. This man isn't doing laundry. He's asked us not to show his face because of what he is doing with his company-issued step tracker. Put the Fitbit in a, uh, in a sock, hour and a half on no heat setting in the dryer, 11,000 steps. Thank you. He's earning 11,000 steps without moving. As is the case for many employees, his pedometer is linked to company insurance incentives that can lower his payments. You are now more involved in, well, how much is this bill? Uh, how many steps? Companies benefit from a healthy workforce, and many are rewarding workers with freebies for getting fit. But there's also a growing movement online to cheat the system. We're starting with 3,472 steps. We were curious, do the hacks even work? So we ran our own unscientific test. This does still take some effort on your part to sit here and press this button for a while. Okay, there's a minute, 3,541. That equals about 70 steps. With yeah. I mean, how could you resist uh, this? <laughs> so the, the project uh, called uh, Vegetarian Work Zero was about having plants use these Fitbits using this hack, where actually their cellular activity that is kind of akin to neural impulses in our, in our uh, body. Um, so you have sort of action potentials uh, in plants as well. So that, that those signals would be translated basically into this press of the button. And then eventually recorded in these applications that always come with the smartwatches, right? Because you can't really use the smartwatch without the application. And you can't really install the application without checking the terms of service, uh, which uh, automatically gives all this data off to third parties, right? So basically that's what the plants were doing. They were entering the, this uh, realm of big data collection uh, represented as beings, right? So, or, you know, this wasn't just noise. This wasn't just obfuscation. Uh, they were actually uh, making steps. So this is kind of a translation device. Uh, between uh, consumer electronics intended for humans and the plants. Not to show his face because of what he is doing with his company issued step tracker. So, of course, again, um, the question here was um, how, how do we enable plant representation and also how do we escape this desire uh, that sort of mold uh, our society, the, the, the desire that is commodified uh, upon, that is commodified, and that sort of acts as this trigger uh, for our actions. And um, yeah, in this utopia here, uh, I imagine that plants would at first, of course, represent some noise, but eventually the algorithms would start uh, taking them into account as well, you know, non-humans. Um, and then uh, I'll come to the last uh, and final project. It's also the latest one, even though it's now already uh, two years old. Uh, it's called Play. It was sort of the logical conclusion of these experiments uh, to think not only how to represent plants within the algorithms that exist uh, for this sort of like commodification of humans, but to ask, if I were a plant 
what kind of algorithms would I want written for me? Ones that wouldn't necessarily presume and determine me. And I also thought um, hard about what kind of activity is such um, that can't be actually analyzed in this way. So play came uh, to mind, and play I'm not talking about the game, I'm talking about just the, this act of engagement with your body, with the freedom of movement, with the interactions, play as an act of, uh, of as an expression of freedom. PL means plant, AI, AI obviously. And the work is about creating a robot with an AI that would be able to enter plant time to be able to play with a plant. And so the first step was uh, about figuring out which plants would be uh, easiest to play with. And after a lot of experimentation, cucumbers actually offered their tendril. Uh, this was because, um, yeah, the tendrils are sort of uh, repeating elements. They grow opposite each leaf. So I thought, great, now we, we could have more interaction. Uh, they are also actually quite uh, strange, uh, strange organs um, because it's not absolutely clear what makes them move, nor is it clear how they decide to grab onto something. Initially, I thought that they would just hold on to the first thing that they find, but I've noticed that actually sometimes they would like halfway wrap around something and then just reject it and go for something else, uh, which I think has also the qualities of this freedom that play should uh, contain. Um, so, yeah, visually it's uh, really intriguing. Uh, I think uh, philosophically it also allows enough of uh, this space to imagine that play is something that could in fact be taking place, you know? Uh, play is basically in the eye of the beholder. It's really hard, uh, once, as, as soon as we step out of the, um, uh, let's say, uh, the common forms of interspecies play where we sort of know what's going on, sort of we know the moves of the dog, sort of going in this play position, right? It's a signal, I'm gonna play. But surely octopuses play, probably it, we could figure that out. But what about spiders, right? Uh, and I think ultimately whether you see play or not is not something that can be quantified uh, by a computer. And that sort of escapes the logic of uh, computation as that which uh, unambiguously um, quantifies and, and uh, categorizes events. So even though we are making a robot to play with plants, we will never know whether it is playing, whether we have succeeded, nor is it ever possible to completely dismiss the possibility that we did. Uh, yeah, we made a couple of sketches. Uh, it was a long development process with um, up to, I think at one point we had 10 people working on this uh, with machine vision, uh, an AI specialist, an engineer. Basically, we repeated all of the steps that these people in agriculture take in order to create uh, robotic machinery for working on the field. Uh, so this was one of the first tests that we did with a scanner. Uh, this, for the scanner, we actually just used uh, this RP LiDAR, uh, which is used for autonomous vehicles and it's sort of like a developer's uh, gadget. And we just put it on a rail to get like a 3D representation of the plant. And then uh, we built this up uh, during the first wave of COVID. And this is what the robot now looks like. Uh, so it has these tendrils, the, that end with the colorful balls. Uh, they're actually bouncy balls, and the um, robot has the possibility to move the tendrils uh, up and lower them again, 
based on a sort of a decision process that we are still trying to improve upon. Because, um, believe it or not, it's actually very, very difficult to write an algorithm that wouldn't be uh, deterministic in a certain way. No, I won't use the, the word deterministic. An algorithm that is not determined by um, a, a preset um, notion of what the outcome should be. Uh, so this is uh, one of the early time lapses of what <laughs> it looked like when the machine played with the plants. So the tendrils are actually, uh, yeah, exploring their environment. The computer, so what you see in the background is this actually trolley with a scanner uh, that goes back and forth. Uh, so one layer of input is this 3D scan that it gets of the plants, but unfortunately the resolution is not high enough. Uh, uh, so it never really sees the tendrils. And for that, we had a whole different system. Initially, we thought we were going to use the touch, a touch sensor, but it was absolutely impossible because each one of these uh, metallic strings acted uh, yeah, as an antenna and we just got way too much noise. So in the end, we ended up installing six more cameras <laughs> and tried to solve it via machine vision. This is still also not working that well. Uh, but this is what basically a raw, let's say, image of uh, the scan looks like. So it like goes up uh, and over and then down on the other side. And this is uh, what our first proposal for an AI that would be playing with plants looks like. So I don't know if this actually makes sense to any of you. Uh, it didn't to me either. <laughs> uh, but I'll try to explain it. Um, because I think it's interesting. So this Z um, is called the latent space and it's sort of like a compression algorithm. It's sort of like a matrix uh, stored in, computer, in the computer memory. So every time um, the computer gets a new image from the scan, this matrix is modified ever so slightly and these kind of associations or weights are changed. And then, so this Z, this latent space, is kind of a combination of all past uh, encounters with the plant compressed into the single matrix. And when it would get a new image, this is I as in input, every 15 minutes, it would run this image through the latent space, through its past experience, and then approach the plant according to that. So not directly as, okay, I see this and I'm gonna move here, but rather I see this, this is how I understand it, and according to that, I'm gonna move here. And it is kind of like we see anyway, right? So there's a lot of studies on human vision uh, with those optical illusions that we cannot actually change. Uh, you know, there's the two squares that actually are the same color gray, but because of the context, we can never see it the same color. So it's actually the past has somehow determined our perception. And this is some, something of what is going on in this algorithm as well. And then this C is the so-called classifier. This is uh, the actual contact. When the tendril makes a uh, successful contact with the, with the ball and uh, it grabs on, uh, the computer, uh, the robot stops moving that ball. So because the plants are actually, uh, they actually need some support, right? But that also kind of feeds back into the latent space. Uh, changing that uh, or increasing uh, the, um, 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 I lost the word, reliability uh, of, of that prediction. Um, okay, and this is sort of a final output. Uh, I mean, the, uh, yes, the latest output, but also the final thing I'll be showing. 
Um, this is a representation of this latent space. The latent space is 46 dimensional. Um, the programmer chose it because he thought it was appropriate. So every point is connected to the other or there's like 46 different qualities which we don't really know what they are, what they respond to. Um, uh, so yeah, so each of these images is organized in this latent space according to that. And then this kind of 2D representation is made by taking those two that are the most uh, varied and just collapsing all the others, right? And so these are, I think, uh, just like uh, taking two uh, of two different qualities. Um, so, yeah, I like this one because it's like a happy face, right? <laughs> Uh, what you see here in the uh, upper right corner is basically how the, the, the machine vision uh, picks up on, this, um, on the plants, right? So it's hardly discerning much. So the, the brighter yellow, I, I think, are either lower or higher. So these are kind of like the, the leaves. And here, with every one of these little squares, it almost looks like a pixel. That is an image like that, only in black and white. But what I realized after a while, uh, well, actually, I knew it from the beginning, but I didn't really want to think about it, uh, was that, in fact, with this system where we said, OK, uh, you know, because the, the programmers approached me and, he says, uh, and they said, well, what do you want? Did, what, what is, did, OK, let's do reinforcement learning. Okay, what are we reinforce? We, what are we reinforcing? What kind of behavior? Uh, when is it? Uh, when is the game successful? No, no, no. It's not about that. It's about ontological play. We let the, you know, like the computer, they explore each other. The, we let the computer decide, and we want. We just observe what goes on. And no, this is not going to be possible if you do any type of learning, first of all, you need like a lot of data. Uh, should we model the plant? Yes, let's model the plant. No, 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 please don't model the plant. No, 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 by creating the model of the plant, we would be repeating exactly what I'm trying to escape here. Don't model the plant. Okay, reinforcement learning, it was a sort of a similar uh, thing uh, because then you'd have to decide if the, the, the touch of the tendril was successful and then decide what the question was and how, what we are training the model to do. In any way, it wouldn't work because the, uh, the touching is not frequent enough at all. So we settled uh, on this autoencoder which can be understood as, as, a, as a very primitive uh, neural network. I would, it's hardly actually making any decisions. But it worked. And we got really charming results. But the thing that is really uh, odd in this neural network is the time. And we like to usually think of computation as being uh, outside of our time because it's so fast, right? Just like you think of high frequency trading, right? <laughs> uh, like the, the tempo, uh, the, the way of processing information, we can't keep up with that as biological systems. But in this case, the program had no time. It was like out of time. It, it doesn't actually need an axis of time for it to work. It doesn't need to know if that the plants grow in only one direction. So the latent space exists as a series of, uh, as, as, as a matrix of relations where time isn't a thing. <laughs> and so uh, I asked the programmer if it was possible to nevertheless, you know, coax out this timeline and then using uh, an operation, he was able to find um, this, um, uh, not, not a line a trajectory, but like a surface with which he cut the latent space and then moved uh, orthogonally uh, against it. And this is what the 
time, our time, looks like in this latent space. So this is a small square. And you can, if you look closely, you can actually see it changing. Marvelous. Um, yeah, <laughs> so with this, I'll, I'll sort of conclude uh, the presentation. Right now, I'm yeah really um, digging into agricultural robots and discovering the complexities of this, and also of trying to understand what other more, let's say, sustainable or environment environment enriching practices have uh, in their arsenal and finding that it's that there hasn't really been much of a merger of technology and things like regenerative farming or permaculture even though we're now you know developing sophisticated enough ro robots that they would possibly be able to deal with something that isn't like a monocultural field, super flat and super dependent on just one operation. Uh, yeah, and yet, um, n because of, of course, interests, these robots have not yet been developed. So the only robotics or this kind of advancement is sort of, you know, with John Deere and these... Um, yeah, corporations that are kind of like the other side of Monsanto. Yeah, so that's, I, without actually having any projects already in development, just sort of researching this field, um, I would like to conclude this presentation. Thank you so much for listening.